Okay. I think we'll get rolling. I'm Anthony Walton. And first, I would like to thank you all for coming out this afternoon as we busily approach the hol holidays and the end of the semester. Because I knew I was going to say a few words of introduction about these two stellar young American poets this afternoon, their work has been on my mind. Recently in the poetry workshop here at Bowdoin, we've been reading and thinking about the poets who combine political and social life with the deepest personal concerns and plumbing of private life. And as I tried to come to something to say that would give a larger insight into both of their poetic projects, it occurred to me more and more that both of them paralleled the work we've been recently looking at, including Rita Dove, Joy Harjo, Martina Spada, and Adrian Rich. Excuse me, Adrian Rich. And yes, I'm aware that Adrian Rich is very high praise indeed. I thought about another poet we also studied this semester, Robert Haas. He has a beautiful line. You hear pain singing in the nerves of things. It is not a song. I encourage you to hold that line in your thoughts as you listen to Sarah Garagosian and Heather Tressler. Sarah was educated at Mount Holyoke, at Boston University, where she worked with Nobel laureates Derek Walcott and Louise Glick, and the New York State University at Albany, where she received her PhD and has joined the faculty there. So she must have been doing something right. She is also a recipient of a fellowship for her scholarship from the National Endowment of the Humanities. And also as an aside for all you students, I'd like to note that both of these poets were Phi Beta Kappa as undergraduates. Sarah is the author of two books, Queer Fish and The Death Spiral which builds upon, sorry, right, turn the page here. The beautiful lyrics of the first book in astonishing ways. In particular, I would like to point at the magisterial, I do not think that is too strong a word, family history in which she probes and faces her history as a descendant of Armenia and that tragic history. I hope she will honor us with a reading of that poem this afternoon. Heather Tressler went to university at Brown where she studied under renowned poet and teacher, Michael S. Harper. She then attended the University of Notre Dame as a presidential fellow. Her poems have been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and Best American Poets. And her first volume, Porterition, was recently the winner of the Chapbook Prize from Ireland's Cork International Literary Festival a global contest with thousands of entries. In addition, the book has received 
the 2020 Joan Pedrick Prize from the New England Poetry Club and has been widely praised, including by master American poet Frank Bedard. She is currently an associate pro professor at Worcester State. I'd like to note that their careers can be seen as relatively rare ones these days as they have distinguished themselves as both scholars and poets. And these twin strains of their projects inform and strengthen each other. The resumes I'm citing here are but a mere sample of their accomplishments. And I am firmly convinced prologue to grander achievement. I could say so much more, but I think it's time for me to go quiet. Oh, but one more thing. I've asked the poets to read in a round robin fashion. They will trade off each taking turns, and I hope we'll engage in conversation about the work as the spirit moves. If there is time, I'm hoping they will be able to answer a few questions. And I would like to direct your attention to the Q&A function along the bottom, along the function bar on the bottom of your screen. That's where you can ask a question. And if there is time, I'll curate a few of those questions and pass them along to the poets. Um, I'm hoping I'll be able to answer a few questions, but we'll go by feel on that one because we may decide we just want to hear them. So all that said, please join me under the ongoing and generous sponsorship of the Alpha Delta, Delta, Delta Phi Visiting Writers Fund, the English Department in Golden Creative Writing, and welcoming Sarah Garagosian and Heather Tressler to Bowdoin College. Thank you, Professor Walton, and a huge thank you to Bowdoin College for hosting us and to Lori Holland and Tony Sprague for setting up all of the technical um, technical effects for this Zoom, Zoom reading. I first met Sarah um, in 2017. We were both fellows in an NEH seminar uh, that was organized by Bethany Hitchcock um, in the Vassar College uh, Library. Uh, we were both working in Elizabeth Bishop's archive and um, our friendship was struck up uh, there as we were scrutinizing manuscripts and comparing notes and staying in college dorms as uh, nearly 40 year olds. And um, the conversation grew from there. In fact, um, the two books that we both published this year were I think largely written in that time. So. Um, in the past three years, um, we were an active correspondence and conversation as we were putting, putting these poems and these books together. So it's a special treat to be able to read with someone whose work has um, so informed and often uh, so inspired my own. I think um, I'll start tonight with a poem or two that it sort of speaks to our current moment, as it were. Um, we're just not even a week out from the election. Um, just last week uh, around this time was election day. And I think um, I think for most of us, it's been, it's been quite the week. So um, this first poem that I'll read um, is called Pine. And it's about, um, or it makes reference to the New England colonists uh, here who decided at some point to stop shipping their Eastern white pine trees to, the, to Great Britain. 
um, Great Britain was using those trees specifically for um, the mass of their ship. And it was um, an important part of the British naval power um, in the 18th century. Um, so that act of resistance, that act um, of Massachusetts citizens to essentially stop letting their, their best trees be cut down and exported um, became very symbolic as um, a form of political resistance. Uh, in fact, the first form of currency here in Massachusetts was in fact the, the pine tree shilling. And as I walked about Concord and Massachusetts um, these past few years and thought about forms of political resistance, I increasingly found myself um, drawn to pine trees as sort of symbols of, um, of fighting back. Pine. We sought woods craving the smell of dampened dark earth, soft needled floor beneath Eastern white pine. Nothing here corporate or off gassing, miles away from the new office park and discreet assisted living. Here colonists hoarded their conifers, refusing their harvest as ship mass for the British claiming this sylvan bounty as their own. Thick trunked, notched with a king's broad arrow, the pines stand crowning their parcel of sky. Here, Thoreau pitched in his cabin, a skiff at loose anchor in rough storm, his tautened body a mast wreathed in St. Elmo's fire. Here he tethered charred moods to a desk, nicking at pages as he hoed rows of beans and sweet corn. By the pond's lapping edge, I slip from shoes, longing to ease us from clock time, temperance, mannerly reserve. Rituals of bourgeois life carefully earned. What might steal us away for an hour and let us come home to the rogue facts of each other? Prodigal, road-worn and frayed, you stand on the man-made beach as I stride calf, knee, thigh deep in water. You eye my distance from shore, distance in hunger. Shyly, I stare back at you as if to ask for your nakedness. In a conquered wood of insurrection, we found ourselves formal but feral. Among tallest pines, we grew riven, ravenous. That's a beautiful poem, Heather. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I like the way that you're weaving together local history with personal history. I, um, like you, am from Massachusetts. And so I think I'll follow with my own poem about Massachusetts that weaves together uh, colonial history with personal his history. Um, it's called Birth State. Birthed into a state of hush hush now, be careful what you say. State of ambush and massacre, mild manners and mother goose treasury. And never have I ever games in the back pews of colonial churches. State of emergency, of witch trials and white complicity and too late commemoration. State your name and occupation. Louder, please. No, that's too loud. Watch your state of mouth. State of amnesia, of diluted histories, bone shards in the soil, and ice cream parlors aplenty. State of Shays' Rebellion and King Philip's War and respectability politics. Anne Hutchinson, banished. Emily Dickinson, secluded. State of exception, of the monster and the common, and of code switching and sports fanatics and unpayable heating bills of Eastie and Seneca tanks filled with jet fuel, an industry all along the harbor, state of grace, 
state of JFK nostalgia, state of no Irish need apply, state of where are all the revolutionaries, state of one of the vastest gaps between richest and poorest, Bay state of my childhood of swan boats and cobblestone roads and make way for ducklings, summer days with salt water in my hair and nights of standing room only in the back stands of Fenway, state of too many field trips to the Freedom Trail to count, state of privilege and electricity bills unpaid and vaunted public school education, state of cold snaps and don't complain and sweater upon sweater in the uninsulated summer house or burnt out house to our town where we lived all year long. State of trot trot to Boston, trot trot to Lynn and outings to Cambridge bookstores to browse, browse the days away. And roundabout questions leading to what will you do with your education? State of church pantry meals with mother and later stomach and knots feasts with Harvard elites. State of doubt, state of liquor stores and cranberry bogs to rest the eyes on, of gracious, anxious Thanksgiving family dinners, and Henry Louis Gates arrested upon entering his own home, and on the news, his mouth and O. Oh. That's amazing, Sarah. Uh, what a great poem. I think you're giving um, Whitman a run for his money with the <laughs> catalog of, of Massachusetts things. Um, uh, one of the things I, I also really admire about your poetry is how animals and landscape are always more than metaphor. They're a primer for, for our survival, essentially, that we ignore at our peril. And um, I think before we started sharing work, I was always sort of an armchair naturalist. I was um, probably too content to stay indoors and admire nature from uh, the safety of a window and an easy chair. Um, but your work, particularly with um, your interest in, in birds, uh, definitely kind of inspired um, me to take a closer look at things. Um, and I'm gonna read a, a newish poem from this past summer. Um, during the pandemic, uh, wild turkeys completely took over my neighborhood, they staged a sort of casual coup and started walking basically right down the middle of the street. Um, so I got interested in, in turkeys and discovered um, at dusk one day that they actually um, perch in trees and undergo a kind of comic charade of flying into a treetop, um, having to heft basically 20 pounds of bird into air. It's uh, it's like watching a really adole a gawky adolescent play basketball or something. Um, but this was also, of course, um, against the backdrop of um, our political discourse this past summer, which was also intensifying. So there's a bit of that in here as well. Um, and I'll say too that bachelor turkeys are known as Tom turkeys. So this poem is called Tom's. All strut and gibbering, waddles and caruncles, tom turkeys parade at dusk, panoply of feathers fanned, snoods and gorged and dangling over their sharpened beaks, while their heads turn from red to white to blue in tricolor blush, pulsing placards above their sexual taxis. Hens, loitering in shade, graze acorns and the occasional grub, an eye cocked, nonplussed. They've seen this all before. Ben Franklin thought the fowl vain and silly, but respectable, more American than the thieving eagle. Hens sense that courtship, like government, rarely is as dainty as ballet of bower birds. And of the preening toms, who hasn't felt the need to wear a brighter face for love or war? At dusk, they flock to the wooded edge of town and mate quietly on ground. Then one by one, 
they take running starts, wings pumping, and like battered 747s, ascend to perch on spiky feet, nestling along limbs longer than their own. Small miracle, how they vault their 20 pounds of pulse and air, as after a day of too many hours, uphill the last set of stairs. Galliforms, sharp-sighted by day, are night-blind prey. My predator is my dark. After love, I too sleep on a second story. I love that, Heather. That's a new poem for me. Um, the way that you're able to weave together the political and the animal is, is um, really astonishing. And there's an authority of voice in your poetry that reminds me of Marianne Moore or Elizabeth Bishop um, that I really admire. And um, I just wanted to say that, I, I just wanted to ask you, like, the, the ways in which you're able to combine exposition with this kind of propulsive lyric energy seems really difficult to manage, at least for me. Um, do you wanna say a little bit about how you're able to maintain that energy while also providing so much back, important background information about the bird? Um, well, that's a lot of high praise, Sarah, thank you. Um, I think, you know, uh, the poetry mentor that actually uh, Professor Walton and I shared, uh, Michael Harper, he used to say, he was a friend of Elizabeth Bishop's, and he used to say um, to me when I was a student, um, get obsessed and stay obsessed. And I think, um, uh, you know, my friends were probably very bored um, when I was de detailing the physiognomy of turkeys um, sort of obsessively this summer, but I was reading everything I could about, about the birds um, because they are of course an American icon, but they're also um, pretty comedic and, um, and intriguing as well. So, um, you know, Elizabeth Bishop, I think said um, in one of her journals, observation is a joy and she also thought that people, she says in a letter somewhere, would be um, a lot less miserable if they just observed more, which um, I always took, uh, took to heart. Um, uh, but I certainly learned a lot from you and your attention to, um, to the natural world as not just sort of a foil for the human, but as something that's um, essential to our, to our understanding. Um, your various poems about raptors, uh, among other things, uh, have been deeply intriguing and inspiring in that way. So. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, um, I'm kind of a raptor nerd, as you know. Um, I actually work with raptors at a, a wildlife sanctuary and um, rehabilitate them. So I'm around birds quite a bit. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in um, animal ontologies, ways of being in the world, um, ways of sensing the world that are inhuman um, and that allow us to kind of stretch our imagination while also, you know, ballasting our, um, our imaginations and research and scientific knowledge. Um, I, I think I'll follow with, um, a bird poem. Um, and this is in my new collection that I'm working on right now called The First Hunger. And it's about um, a little black vulture that I know named Virgil, who is um, kind of a prankster. He follows me around at the rehab um, sanctuary and likes to untie my shoelaces as I feed the animals. So this is um, Virgil the vulture contemplates life. That itch on your back, secondaries growing back. Exult in the ruff of feathers, tar black, bristling at the nape of your neck. Relish the ambrosia waft of carcass in early rot. Hiss, grunt, or sneeze 
You know how to clear a room, how to foe seas, how to split my sides with your hunchbacked prance. You're a glider of thermals, an undertaker with a taste for innards, a gourmand affluent in gizzards, a digester of tiny bones, cholera, and mouse fur. And when you're done, you, genius of bricolage, make daisy chains from the remains, ugly duckling bits, tails, mandibles of mice, skeins of pelage. If I get in the way, I can count on the acid bath of your de defensive vomit to burn more than acid rain. Spitfire, you're more than a prowler or meddler. With leftovers, you're sober, and your ways, though bloody, are never profligate. A moocher, maybe, but better than that, you're imbued with dinosaur suave each time you cock your head to give me the side eyes, fold your wings in like a tent, and feed with the flies. Daintily, do you disembowel a rat? Do you dab at flecks of meat? After flat footing around on the frayed ropes of your feet, you rest and nibble at your feathers, greasy with preen oil. A little spoiled, perhaps, but rotten, no. Oh, Virgil, I catch you taking stock of me now and then, but you can see I'm not ready. Although it's a blessing, I suppose, to know that you never let me go to waste. That's a great ending, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks. I didn't see that coming at all. <laughs> a little bit of grotesque in there as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I love how your aviaries um, draw us into the tactility of, of the physical world. Um, one of my favorite things about reading your work, I often read it out loud, is just um, sort of the de deliciousness of the language on the tongue, but also how um, it really calls uh, the palpable world um, to mind in a way that I think the reader can almost uh, feel the textures in their hands in a, in a remarkable way. Um, to continue with the with the bird theme for just um, one more poem more. Um, this one is uh, that I'll read is from my book, uh, the one that was just out this year. And um, it takes place in Maine, it's called Seabirds. And um, it's about storm pet petrels uh, who stay on the water their entire lives, um, except for when um, they're mating or nesting. So. I was very intrigued to see, um, to watch these birds. Um, and um, I was sort of in envy of the clear instincts that seem to govern their lives. They don't seem to be creatures who um, are sort of structurally capable of ambivalence, which uh, is often kind of um, appealing. And it also, it takes place um, during this time of year, which is um, something I think we experience pretty profoundly in New England, that period of time between daylight savings and the solstice, in which, for me at least, I start to feel like I'm living in a low-ceilinged room because the days are, are shorter and um, have less light. Seabirds and how they angle their bodies over water with tensile intention, masters of hover and swoop, dart and splay. Technique in these storm petrels at the level of instinct, which watching from shore, we might mistake as pleasure, claiming each elegant instance of nature as something ultimately about ourselves not a good meal's necessary murder, the calculus of want that drives a beak's precision. In the foreshortened days before solstice, the business of sleep hardly put away before we are at midday craving it again, a retreat into warmth from the low dark that comes over cape houses and marsh 
in the startling cold of matchstick December and the sheared mirror of a half-frozen salt bay. We sat in a warm car, watching the last hour of light ravish, then subtract itself from the winded tapestry of reeds, the slick backs of feeding petrels. We admit to envying their honed vision, their eyes detection of the flicker of fin as known to them as a mate's plumage. How have we arrived at early midlife to find desires opaque or dimmed to a decibel beyond hearing? In the scripts that fell, hidden mantles on the children we once were, in the grief of knowing we were wrong from the start, unable to trust in the unseen or to see without seeing to the point of pain, to bear willingly the brunt of family ambition and name into regard if not renown, to fear even then the ostracon of tribal shun and to have shaped a twinned existence, giving to Caesar an accord with his remand while hiding a spare and shiny penny, bright as a bird's eye, as our own. The Petrel's theater is governed by nature. They act in concert with belly and bone. They are not otherwise, abroad or at home. They do not shirk from violence in algorithmic continuance. Their songs necessity a midwinter music. I've read this poem on the page, but hearing you read it has just animated it that much more for me. Um, I really, I, I love the kind of Bishop-like changes in perspective, the, the telescoping in and out from the miniature to the grander scale and the ways in which that parallels um, the kind of retrospective uh, view of the, the speaker uh, meditating on the, um, the petrol. It's a really beautiful poem, Heather. Um, and to hear you read it, um, yeah, there's, there's a sense of um, um, really a, this kind of acuity of vision and empathy with the creature as well that I'm, I'm really astonished by. And again, the kind of subtle changes in perspective and point of view are really, really effective. Um, yeah. Um, I, let's see, I'm trying to think of a poem that might be in conversation with that one. Um, I mean, I have a million bird poems, but I don't know if everyone wants to hear these bird poems. Um, we could see. probably come to earth. Should we come back to earth? Sure, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'll read a poem then from um, Queer Fish, which um, is my first book. It's a, what I call a queer bestiary. In other words, um, we know that uh, over 500 um, animals have displayed homosexual behavior. And as I, I said, I'm really interested in the ways in which animals can teach us about uh, queer forms of being, queer forms of loving. Um, and stretch the imagination. Um, but I have a poem um, that I'll read um, specifically about climate change that brings us back to the earth and it puts us in the perspective of, um, well, I guess, I, I guess I would say that there are, this is a poem that explores various angles of vision um, and also considers um, our collective history um, as beings, not just humans, but all organisms. It's called All at Sea. I am not blameless living off of my mother's belly. I know my thirst and I know my crimes and I know yours. But do you remember in your dreams, 
our emergent bodies ghosting below the sea line. Remember how we learned from the singing flowers, the viruses, the cetacean songs that echoed below the ice sheeted earth. I miss those songs still. How we thrilled in somatic reply from body to body to wave after wave. Do you remember the coastlines and their riches before we branch forth limbs and stood ashore, our infant knees trembling forth? And can you dream her up as she was then before our fatal bloom across her giving breast? They say the sea is a mirror. Look, and there we are. A fluke, a dying kind. And our mother now, she is there, shrunken, sagging, shocked by our overhandling and the banquet we hold across the spine of her back. Like you, I am a monster of desire. And when I drink her in, I taste my grave. I have maimed her to the core, but her logic of mercy is neat. When I thirst for the last time, mother will be a yielding desert and I shall suck her bones dry. Wow, Sarah, uh, that's amazing. Um, I'm struck by how uh, in both invigorating animals and landscapes and, and humans and their history, um, uh, there are those parallels in, in your work that I admire so much, just the fluidity with which you move between, um, move between those discourses or, um, or actually suggest that they're their separation is something that we impose that's not actually um, really there, uh, which is um, one thing that I think your poems really invite us to feel um, in a kind of visceral way that um, these binaries are actually quite false and um, distorting. Um, I guess to move in the direction of the human um, and also maybe in the direction of Maine, since I'm aware that uh, were it not for the pandemic, we would both be in Brunswick, Maine, um, maybe enjoying some seafood after this reading, um, and that our students are are from from Bowdoin, so they know Maine pretty well. Um, my book uh, starts in Louisiana and sort of pauses for a little bit and or for a while in Missouri, and then it ends in Maine, and that geographical uh, journey roughly parallels, parallels the narrator's search for a certain kind of autonomy and choice and freedom. So I think I'll, I'll conclude my section of the reading with um, this poem, Shorelines, uh, which takes place, uh, actually, I guess it's more in Southern Maine, in Agunquit, Maine, um, and deals with some of those themes. Shorelines. Whatever is the opposite of keening, that is the sound the waves make, trawling themselves across the long, shallow shore in Agunquit, Maine. Home in another century to fishermen who built a tidewater basin, furrowing the soft marshland, digging a channel to give safe harbor to boats named Susan B. Clementine and Anna May. In time, shucking shacks and sturdy docks sprung up in Perkins Cove with a drawbridge and coils of hemp rope, weathered like hands scored by clam knives and raw mornings that redden the nose faster than whiskey or woman in heat. Fishermen, you imagine, lived by tides, their ancient faces buffeted like driftwood cast on the beach by the last spasm of storm. Painters arrived later, drawn by the ubiquity of light, the changeling shore, these clappered houses jutting like defiant chins from the bluffs each built like an axiom from Emerson. Self-trust, 
innate spark, nature's mirror of soul, each man a forgivable God. Here against the ocean's sotto voce, a gravely drawl like the history of smokes in a lounge singer's voice, urgent in its surges, slow in the pleasure of its retreat. Here, overlooking a saltwater strand, as if it were your birth canal, the history of your angst and wailed arrival. Here, alongside white sand and dark wet rocks that cover it, lovingly, lending land some provisional protection, solidity against the inquest of water, which is a version of time and warmth, though it be from stones. Here in a cliffside cottage, you discover your lover's unfathomably delicate ear, curved softly as a conch shell, and the hewn channel of his pelvic girdle, its melding of smooth muscle and bone, almost feminine in its line, though it hinges a man in his centaur existence, half above, half below, a navel that buttoned him once to the first woman to offer him hospitality, the care of her body. That day, you found little to say, little to squander in speech. For the first time, when you fell back, sated, you didn't need to ask what he was thinking. You didn't ransack the shelves for some abiding crumb to feed lingering hunger. You had, for once, satisfied what took you past girlhood's parish and garden gate, granting exile permission and village, citizen and state. That poem is a tour de force, Heather. Um, I'm just, I'm so um, in awe of the ways in which the environmental um, imagination becomes um, a source of resilience. The erotic is interwoven with the environmental um, and the ways in which there's just really um, like gorgeous um, uh, um, ways in which that uh, the, the reader is um, asked to kind of enact the, um, the methodical granular look of the speaker herself. Here against the ocean, sato vo voce, a gravelly drawl, like the history of smokes in a lounge singer's voice, et cetera. Um, there's a way in which the reader is kind of invited into the space. Um, uh, yeah, and the, the handling of syntax is um, really beautiful as well. I really um, admire that poem. Um, Thank I, you. I guess I'll, I'll finish with um, a poem, uh, a poem that um, Professor Walton asked me to read, which is also about uh, memory and resilience. Um, and it's called Family History, and it is um, in memory of my great-grandmother who survived the Armenian Genocide. No God is more inscrutable than ours. Think of how our century began, red fistfuls of pomegranate blossoms knuckling the windows in the early dawn, a warning mist and a call to rise. And at the doors, the early monsters of modernity, trained to be meticulous, expedient, propitiated neither by suffering or the scroll of exile. Think of your grandmother with her rabbit beat heart. She knew something about hope's atrophied muscles and the secrets of rubies. She scooped pomegranate seeds into her pockets to sustain her. 
During the march, God roosted in her inner ear and whispered back such strange flashes of memory. The first clean A she played on her spiked fiddle, the last goat she skins, the wet cord that tied her to her son, the gleam of her sister's scissors that snipped it off, the gleam of the bayonet that killed him. She watched her daughter's ribs peek through the skin and in time realized that God is anonymous and intimate as a nurse who can deliver pain or take it away in the same breath. What do we say? Our family history, a death sentence, and yet you breathe, you tell me the rest. It's astonishingly beautiful, Sarah. It's uh, it's an amazing poem. It, it, there's something very Jeffrey Hill about it to my ear um, in lines like, God is anonymous and intimate as a nurse who can deliver pain. Um, I hear Hill as, as a definite echo there. Um, but this opening of, of history as a kind of mouth and source of language and poetry's urgency is, um, it's just in, incredible. Um, and the delineation uh, so respectfully and meticulously of your great grandmother's journey, the loss of her son, um, the fragmentation of memory across that uh, trek is, is um, just open for the reader in a, an astonishingly um, generous way, I think. Thank you for reading it. It's, um, Thank you. That's that's so kind. Thank you. Sure, sure. I think we have some questions. Um, Professor Walton, do you want to direct us towards certain ones? I'm just checking out the Q and A box. Um, um, well, I think we have time for one um, because we are approaching the dinner hour very quickly and folks probably have places to get to. But here's a nice uh, general question. Uh, what are some of your favorite poets that you've been reading during the pandemics? And any suggestions for books to read that you've enjoyed during the past year? Um, I, I guess I can jump into the fray here. Um, I've been reading like, like an addict because uh, <laughs> at this moment in time, I think reading is the only way that we can safely go anywhere. So um, I've been reading a fair number of biographies um, uh, in as much as my book does engage with 19th century thinkers like Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, Emerson, um, Frederick Douglass, and others. So um, I've been reading Megan Marshall's biographies of Margaret Fuller and the Peabody sisters, um, as well as biographies of, um, of Emerson and, and Douglass. In poetry, I've been reading um, a fair amount of Adrian Rich, um, and then of course, all the poets that I'm teaching this semester, um, which includes poets like Henri Cole. Um, I also just picked up a, a wonderful book by Elizabeth Powell called Atomizer, which um, the conceit of it has to do with perfume, but it's um, but it goes into all kinds of other places and a kind of Wordsworthian autobiography of scent and living. So. Um, I'm reading just about anything I can get my hands on um, these days, but those are some of the texts I keep coming back to. Sarah? Yeah, those are all great names that you listed. Um, yeah, I find myself returning to some of those classics, June Jordan, Adrienne Rich, um, Lucille Clifton, um, but in terms of recent collections, I, I would recommend uh, Virginia Conchin's newest collection, Any God Will Do, which um, is just a, a very capacious collection in terms of um, its, its ability to, to kind of capture the zeitgeist of the age. Um, 
there uh, she I know um, read for Bedoin last year um, so you may be familiar with her name um, I also quite I'm, I'm very interested in the relationship the, the tensions and the frictions and the affinities between science and poetry so I I recommend um, Code by Charlotte Pence, um, mm -hmm. which explores um, genetic engineering um, uh, alongside questions of mortality about the nature of art as a form of memory making. Um, yeah, there, there's, um, there's really some amazing collections. Um, unfortunately, it's uh, can be difficult to get the word out because of the pandemic, but there, there is a lot out there that um, you can find if you, if you dig around a bit. Yeah, code is, Charlotte Pence's code is wonderful, yes. um, as is Virginia Conscience, Any God Will Do. It's sort of a, um, it's, it's an, it's the kind of poetic atheist track that I can, I can really, um, I can really believe in. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, it's wonderful music. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, I think it's time for us to wind up. Um, on behalf of the college and the Alpha Delta, Delta Phi Readers Fund, I would like to thank you both for gracing us this afternoon. Uh, it's been wonderful to hear you. Um, I've read you both for a while and it's wonderful for me to hear your voices. I think that everyone here would also agree. Um, I would also like to say that um, those of you who might like to revisit this reading, it will eventually be posted by the college. And so you'll be able to hear it again uh, and again. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for the opportunity. This has been great. Yes, you're very welcome. Okay. Uh, thank everybody. I thank everybody for coming and giving us your time at a late point of the evening. So thank you. <laughs>